Hi, I'm Ken Cadet with the Entrust Cybersecurity Institute. We are here at RSA 2023 talking to our partners about Zero Trust. Today, I'm really happy to have Alex Khan of HashiCorp uh, with us here. Alex, welcome. Thank, um, you. thank you for being here. Why don't you introduce yourself, your company, what you guys do, what's your sure. role? So I'm Alex Khan, so I'm from HashiCorp. And so I'm on our partner alliances team. I actually look after all of our technology partners. So I'm actually managing the team now. So any technology partner that we have a relationship, uh, I, I help manage that relationship. To answer your, your second question, what is HashiCorp? <laughs> so um, HashiCorp is a, we're an infrastructure automation company. So this can mean a, a lot of different things to a lot of people, but primarily we enable companies to adopt to the cloud. Uh, and as they migrate out, we have a couple of set of products that, that assist with this transition. And so, you know, our first product is Terraform, which is what we're, we're most popular known for. This is really a product that's helping people do infrastructure as code. So how do you automate this and have immutable infrastructure? The, the second product that we're well known for is Vault, which is around security man uh, secrets management. Uh, and so that, you know, it's going to be the basis of our conversation today in, in that kind of that area. And then the third one is console, which actually ties into service discovery, service mesh. So this product uh, stack helps companies as they think about how are they moving from your traditional legacy on-prem systems to adopt you know, the cloud and then become multi-cloud, et cetera. So think about it, you're talking to a lot of partners. What are you hearing in the market in terms of security, zero trust, those areas? What kinds of what kinds of questions or concerns are you hearing out there? Well, so first, I guess the, the biggest thing is like, what is zero trust? Yeah. You know, I mean, everybody has a slightly different flavor or an opinion of zero trust. And so one of the, the big things that I kind of look at is say, all right, let's take that foundational piece of what is zero trust? How has it been defined by the White House? And it's really, you know, the you know, trust nothing, authenticate everything, you no longer have a perimeter. And so what does that actually mean? So when we start taking a look at it for HashiCorp's kind of version of this is, listen, identity underpins everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do we provide identity to non-humans, to devices, machines, services, et cetera? And once you can kind of give those things an identity, then you can actually start tracking and saying, hey, is this thing allowed to talk to that thing? Can you get secrets from a, for a web server? You know, those sorts of aspects. So it's really about being able to implement a posture that says, you know, I already know an infiltrator is inside my network. So how am I preventing them from doing something? And then, you know, then it's using the various sets of products and services that are out there that really allows you to, to implement that strategy. Makes sense. So um, let's dive into that a little bit sure. more. Um, how do um, how, how does secrets management fit into the 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 zero trust journey, the zero trust con uh, context um, that 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 organizations are looking at? Sure. So secrets management is interesting. So let's quickly define what is secrets sure. management, right? So secrets management is being able to store, audit, configure anything in the world that you consider a secret. So <laughs> it could be username and password, which is the classic one. It could be API keys. It could be your mother's favorite color, doesn't really matter. It's something that you want to be, you know, you want to keep sensitive. So the way that we look at it is secrets management, there's a couple of really important things that you're doing. Here. One is how do you track what systems are accessing what six, what secrets at what time? Yeah. How are you being able to actually rotate your secrets and being able to do short-lived secrets? So when you start thinking about a zero trust strategy, you know, number one is you need to know who's accessed what. Like that's a fundamental piece. You have to have that uh, auditability around there because if something does get leaked, well, you need to know where it's from, who's been able to access it, and those sorts of aspects. Then one of the other kind of key piece to this, and this is you know kind of more a little bit more of what we look at with with Vault, for example, is actually having short-lived secrets. Mm. So this idea of dynamic or ephemeral credentials that you can change and rotate on a fairly regular basis. And so we look at this both from being like database credentials or potentially with encryption keys, being able to do short rotation so, um, cycles, PKI, et cetera. So it's really around secrets management is this idea that I have a centralized repo where mm -hmm. I'm able to see all of this and then I'm able to implement a little bit more of those advanced practices around having short-lived. Because effectively what happens if you have short-lived secrets, if something does get leaked out, then your you know, quote unquote blast radius is actually quite small because those sure. secrets are not going to be valid for very long. Right. We've been talking here a lot about post-quantum. We've been hearing a lot about post-quantum encryption yeah. and what that's, um, what that's going to mean. How, is that, how are you guys thinking about that as you, as you think, about, um, think about secrets management, as you're thinking about um, you know, overall strategies sure. for customers? So post-quantum is interesting because like, NIST still hasn't figured out what they're doing for post-quantum yet. 
And if I remember correctly, like three of the five algorithms they were considering were already cracked. So you're like, all right, that's uh, let's, let's figure that part out. But the part way of the, the process, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and thankfully they're doing it now rather than later. Right. <laughs> um, but one of the big things that we're looking at is how do we become prepared for it? So really, it's about it. Just you know, like once the algorithms are are finalized by NIST, then we can go in and start adopting them inside of the, inside of our tool chain. But so that, I think that's the number one thing is just being ready for adopting whatever those three, four, or five sets of, of algos, whenever that finally gets finally gets done. But in the meantime, to help companies think about like what does it mean to be quantum prepared? Because a lot of people will talk about the, you know, Harvard is now decrypt later. Right. And so there's a couple of really good practices that we're seeing people do. So number one is having good um, data data sanity and data cleansing in the sense that Listen, if you're going to store a PII or very specific sensitive data, making sure that you do that in a very segregated environment is really important rather than just keeping it with maybe everything else. Because at that point, then your, your chances of that, that data being exposed and being able to be harvested becomes greatly reduced. I think the other piece is, is rotating encryption keys on a very regular basis. You know, A lot of companies will say, hey, I have an encryption key, I've done it. And then 10 years later, they're like, oh, maybe I need to rotate it. You know, that sort of aspect, you pull that forward and using certain sets of technology that enable you to do this shorter live so you can actually automate this. Because one of the key things, especially with, with zero trust, with being quantum prepared, is actually having a strategy for being able to do short lived credentials and being able to make this all automated. So if you can't automate it, then your security strategy will, will kind of go to pot because humans are valuable. You know, work prone to mistakes, people drop the ball, you know, those sorts of aspects. So automation is actually going to be a key to being able to have a really good security posture as well. Yeah, I'm guessing AI is going to become really a part of that automation strategy at some point. Potentially. So this is going to be or machine a, learning, right? Machine learning, definitely. Yeah. I think, you know, like if, if we look at like what's happening right now in the in the large language model space, you know, yeah. it's really super it's very interesting to see like how people are going to be able to do this? Because like I can see one quick apl application of this is how do I generate security policies? And you know, like you, certain products are very complicated to to do this. Right. And so, can I use these sorts of tools to be able to enable me to do this quicker? On the reverse side of this is you also have to think about the data privacy, data security. How are you going to be using these large language models and not be exfiltrating your own data? Uh, you know, we saw this recently with a large company where they were putting in all their confidential data into ChatGPT, and you're like, yeah, that's not the best thing to do in the world. So as we start thinking about what does it mean for, for privacy and, and data, you know, AI is going to be a, it's going to be a great en enhancement and accelerator, but it's also something that has to be very carefully managed because it can kind of go out of control really, really quickly. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so if you're a if you're a CISO or even a CIO or a business leader, what kinds of questions should you be asking as you're moving ahead on your zero trust yeah. journey, making sure you're covering the bases in some of the areas we've been talking about? What kinds of questions should you be asking maybe your own team or your partners? I think, so there's a, there's a couple of things that I look at it is, you know, number one, how are we reducing anything that's static? So if we start thinking about like, you know, how do we have IAM providers? You know, how do I no longer have people have to have 25 passwords? That means they reuse it, right? So having a good strategy around single sign-on is fantastic, right? And there's loads of really good providers out there. So that'd be kind of like, that's a little bit of what I would call a table stakes, but it's sure. still interesting to see the number of companies that still don't do this, right? And so, you know, the, the minute you can reduce the amount, of, the amount of passwords that people are using, that makes it quicker. You know, obviously then enhancing like, hey, do I have two-factor? or multi-factor authentication in there and using some of those techniques. Because I think when we start thinking about what is zero trust and how this happened is most of the security breaches today are going to be through people, going to be in your supply chain. So then it's kind of looking at how am I really going to be providing authentication and, me and measures to work with my supply chain and, and kind of secure all of that. And then from there it's around, you know, once you get to the deeper levels and kind of, you know, we have like level 100, level 200, you know, then this is where I'm going to preach HashiCorp a little bit, you know, like how are you doing centralized secrets management? Super. Mm -hmm. Then level 300 is how am I doing everything dynamic and just in time? Because the, the less that you have out there that's static, the less chance of it getting exposed and, and those sorts of aspects. So for me, it's just kind of, you know, understanding what that qual rock run st steps are for the company and seeing where they are in that maturity model. So certain companies are like, hey, I still need to, you know, adopt an SSO or an IAM provider. 
Others are going to be like, hey, I want to do everything dynamic and just in time and just understanding what does it mean to get to that, that journey. So any final takeaways you'd want to leave our viewers with? Well, I think you know, what, what's to me is super fascinating right now, and we've seen this with, the, with, with Zero Trust and how, how quickly it's become a mainstream. I mean, it's been around for a long time, but with mm -hmm. like the White House really pushing on it and also looking at how quickly you know, the, the, the GPT-4 models and AI is kind of becoming in there. It's really, I think the absolute key is just making sure you have your good foundational pieces in, in place, you know, understanding what does it mean to have security best practices being able to do this on a constant basis and not having a constant rigor around it. That to me is like the kind of the really vital piece that's going in there. And, and you know, I see there's a lot of opportunity for folks with AI to do a lot more phishing and automation and all that. So the more, the quicker you adapt to your foundational postures, I think the more prepared people will be for, for when something does happen and you really limit that, that damage that can happen. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Really Appreciate enjoyed it. this conversation. Yeah. Um, and thank you everyone for watching.